community webinar. You'll notice as you're coming in that we're making sure that everyone's camera is off and that your microphones are muted. Uh, that's just to save as much bandwidth as possible. Uh, but if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to drop them in the chat. And while we're waiting for a few more people to enter the room, um, feel free to tell us where you're tuning in from today and tell us what your favorite fish is. And we'll just give people a couple more moments to enter. All right, it is just after seven o'clock, so we'll get started. First, a couple of introductions. We're very excited to have our keynote presenter, Erin, with us today. She's a PhD candidate at Trent University in the Integrative Fish Ecology Lab. And we also have a couple of staff members from Watersheds Canada. My name is Nicole, I'm the Freshwater Health Coordinator. And we also have Monica, who is the Communications and Fundraising Manager. And if you have any tech problems throughout the presentation, you can feel free to send Monica a private message on Zoom and she'd be happy to help you out. And now a little bit about Watersheds Canada. Watersheds Canada is a nonprofit and charitable organization based in Perth, Ontario. We deliver programs across the country in partnership with landowners, community groups, and students who are looking to take action to protect their freshwater. So on the screen, you can see some photos of a couple of our different programs. On the top left, we have our Natural Edge program, which is where we work with community groups, shoreline owners to naturalize their properties using native plants. On the bottom left is our Love Your Lake program, which we deliver in partnership with Canadian Wildlife Federation. And this is a shoreline evaluation program where we fill out an assessment for each property. Uh, on a lake and each property owner gets a custom report with voluntary actions that they can take to help protect the health of the lake. And then on the top right, we have our fish habitat restoration program. So in this program, we work with community groups to lead projects such as walleye and trout spawning bed restorations, cold water creek enhancements, and adding wood woody debris with brush bundle projects. And then finally on the bottom is one of our newer programs, which is the Nature Discovery Program. And this is an outreach program for children and youth. Um, and we help people have tools to safely connect with nature in this program. And then the program that we're all here for today is our Freshwater Stewardship Community, which is an online community that is connecting people from across the country. We're in the third year of this program, which launched in 2021. And all of our webinars and handouts are archived on our website. So you can find them at watersheds.ca slash freshwater dash stewardship. And I'd encourage you to check those out today. It's uh, webinars with speakers from the private sector, other nonprofits and academia, so a wide range there. And we would also like to thank the ECHO Foundation, Peterborough KM Hunter Charitable Foundation, and the SM Blair Family Foundation for their funding support this year. So here's an example of one of the handouts that I was talking about. Um, so after the presentation today, you can expect to receive an email in your inbox that will have a recording of this presentation, and then also a copy of a handout, which will share key information from Aaron's presentation, as well as additional resources so that you can take action after today's presentation. And I'm also excited to let you know uh, about a couple more webinars that we have coming up this month. Um, so one of those is a webinar about coastal resilience, which will take place on November 20th with uh, Rosemary from Helping Nature Heal. And we'll also have some more information about the other webinars on our website soon, so you can keep an eye out this week. And you register for all of those at the same place that you registered for this webinar, which is watersheds.ca slash freshwater dash stewardship. And now I would like to introduce our speaker. Erin is a PhD candidate at Trent University studying ecophysiology of fishes in the context of climate change under Dr. Graham Raby and Dr. Chris Wilson. 
Her research is focused on brook trout thermal tolerance and seeks to understand what drives variation in thermal tolerance of fish and how brook trout will respond to climate change across their native range. She has done a combination of lab and field experiments across Ontario on over 30 distinct populations of brook trout, working and consulting with government agencies, First Nations, conservation authorities, nonprofits, and private landowners. Prior to her PhD, she obtained her honors Bachelor of Science in the in Natural Resources Conservation, Science and Management at the University of British Columbia. So with that, I'll pass it over to you, Erin. And if anyone thinks of any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll answer them at the end during the question and answer period. Thank you, Nicole, for the introduction. And thank you everyone for attending this evening. I'm really excited to speak about this with you all. This is obviously what I'm very passionate about and I'm really grateful for the opportunity from Watersheds Canada. So the question of my thesis and what I'm really passionate about is can Ontario's brook trout cope with climate change and how does their thermal tolerance play a role in uh, what their future is going to look like in Ontario. So before I get started, I just wanted to make a few quick thank yous. Uh, first of all, as Nicole mentioned, my two supervisors, Dr. Graham Raby and Dr. Chris Wilson, fund and support my research um, through numerous grants uh, and their positions at Trent University and the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, and I've also received funding and assistance uh, from numerous organizations, uh, and I've collaborated with um, just so many stakeholders. I couldn't list them all out, but I've included all their logos there as a thank you. Um, and so that you can all see who's involved in brook trout research, just even in Southern Ontario. Um, so I'm gonna start out by introducing you to brook trout for those that are unfamiliar, uh, but I'm sure if you're on this call, a lot of you are passionate about them. Um, brook trout native range stretches from, uh, sorry, <laughs> the, Appalachian Mountains in the south comes up the mountains and then comes across eastern Canada all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. They've also been introduced in parts of western Canada and the western United States where they're actually acting as more of a pest species uh, than a beloved species like they are here. I'm going to focus in on their range in Ontario for the rest of the presentation. Uh, and this map here is showing you the same information as the one before, but now overlaid, those points are each of the individual populations that have been described as of this map in 92. Uh, there could be more now, um, but you would see them, the dots are all in the same places there. Um, so we have a significant amount around the Algonquin hump up in the southeastern corner of the province, but they stretch all the way to the very northwest as well. Brook trout come in many different forms, is the easiest way to say it. Uh, up at the very northern edge of the province, you'll actually encounter these populations that are anadromous. And they act like a Pacific salmon might. It's not required of them to go in and out of the ocean, but a lot of the populations up in this region will. They'll use the thermal habitat there, the resources, they'll grow really large. A along the coast of Lake Superior is an example of where these fish are patagomous or lake and river migratory, and they can move in and out of the tributaries into these large lakes, and again, take advantage of the resources and habitat in both areas. Then down in Southern Ontario, we have our stream resident populations as below about Rice Lake and Simcoe. Um, you really won't find many lakes, especially cold water lakes. And so brook trout down here are in their stream resident form, uh, where they are constantly in the flow of water and they're generally found in more headwater streams. The rest of the province is your quintessential brook trout, what you would expect. They're uh, generally a little bit larger. They're found in mostly lakes, but they can move through river systems um, and between lakes as well. So as an example of one of these, here's an Algonquin brook trout. Um, these brook trout are, again, they're larger, um, they're the big, beautiful spotted ones you see, um, and they're sort of our iconic populations in Canada. 
Down in Southern Ontario, we have our beautiful, tiny little stream resident populations. Both of these pictures here, you're seeing a, um, a male spawner. Um, I wish I could show you a scale, but um, they are very different in size and they act very differently in their ecosystems. So those big lake resident populations, they can generally live to about seven plus years old. They can again be lake resident or they can migrate between uh, lakes and rivers. They grow a lot more quickly than their uh, stream resident counterparts and they'll grow somewhere to somewhere between 25 and 50 centimeters. Their stream resident counterparts will generally not live past five years of age. They will only live in streams, but that is only because they're limited to the streams. Um, they're gonna grow much slower. The resources available in the streams are a lot less energy rich as, um, as they would be in the lakes. And therefore they're gonna stay a lot smaller, um, maxing out at about 30 centimeters if you're lucky. An example of a spawner in these two populations uh, is a pretty drastic difference. So up on the top there is that same population, actually same day we took this picture, that's a spawning male um, from an Algonquin population. And then down at the bottom, those are two spawning females from a population close to Peterborough. Um, those females may be one, maybe two years old, uh, and they were full of eggs, just much smaller and uh, lower number. So the brook trout life cycle, no matter what type or ecotype I might call them, uh, they are, is the same throughout their range. So spawning adults will spawn in mid to late fall. Uh, generally, it'll start around now uh, and finish maybe into December, depending on lake temperature, latitude, um, photo period, and a few other factors like that. Uh, they'll lay their eggs on uh, gravel where there's a groundwater upwelling could be in a lake or in a river system. Um, and then those eggs are going to incubate uh, through the fall all the way into the spring and they'll generally hatch sometime in again like late February to early April, but it's all dependent on the um, ecosystem and the region that they're in. So brook trout are known as a cold water generalist and you have to put cold water in there because they're certainly not a generalist in the grand scheme of fish, but in the uh, grand scheme of cold water fish like our salmonids, our trouts, our chars and our salmons, they're actually one of the most thermally tolerant of that group. Um, and they're also one of the most flexible because they demonstrate this really strong acclimation response to local conditions. So they can live in very cold Northern conditions and they can also live in streams that are reaching temperatures upwards of 20 in the summer. Their thermal tolerance has been studied numerous times. I'm just adding to it. We can never stop learning about it. Um, and so we've seen variation in their thermal tolerance among populations. So those genetically distinct groups, um, we see it across their life stages where certain parts of their lives, they may be more thermally tolerant than others, which I'll get into later. Uh, and we see that across large geographical areas. And that's also a result of how wide of a breadth their range is and the conditions that are within their range. Overall, to summarize their thermal tolerance, in the summer, they're going to occupy temperatures between 10 to 20 degrees Celsius. Their optimum for growth that's been measured in the lab and aligns well with field-based studies is 15 degrees Celsius. And what I'm calling for the purposes of today, their functional maximum, um, which is the temperature that they can comfortably occupy for a given amount of time, um, that they can sustain, uh, sustain foraging and growth in, um, is 24 degrees Celsius, but it's very rare that you would find a fish living in that temperature uh, for more than a few hours at a time, I'd say. Um, so I get a lot of this data from a review that was done by some of the collaborators of mine. Um, and I'm just showing you here the difference between field temperatures that the brook trout are occupying and lab-based temperatures that they're occupying. So you can see that that dotted line there is showing that they're 15 degree Celsius approximately is that optimum temperature for them. They're doing similar uh, things in the field and in the lab, but we are seeing quite a range of um, values across studies. That's what the different dots are there. So I'm gonna get into the science a little bit of uh, thermal tolerance because I think it's important to understand 
when we're talking about thermal tolerance in the context of climate change. So because fish are ectotherms, their metabolism, their energy balance, their internal temperature, everything like that is tied directly to their environmental temperature. Um, and that means that their energy balance is always influenced by the temperature that surrounds them. And so how well they're gonna do in a warmer temperature depends on how their metabolism responds to that warmer temperature. And even just within the species of brook trout, there are very distinct metabolic types where some fish have very efficient, slow metabolisms and others have more inefficient, fast metabolisms. And um, that's evolved over the thousands of years that they've been in the habitats they're in. So on the right here, I'm showing you a simplified diagram of how temperature influences a fish's metabolic rate or how much oxygen they're consuming in their tissues. So the bottom line here is their standard metabolic rate. And you can think of that as like their resting metabolic rate, kind of like we have a resting heart rate. It's when they're doing very minimal activity. It's just what supports their bodily functions when they're functionally at rest. And then up at the top, you have their maximum metabolic rate or their burst swim, you know, when fish dart really quickly. This is what they use when they're doing what we call expensive activities like foraging, they're avoiding predators, or even you could think of it as when they're fighting an angler on a hook. That's when they're using the highest amount of energy, when they're consuming the most amount of oxygen, and that puts the most um, strain on their resources. So generally we see their standard metabolic rate increase with temperature and we see their maximum metabolic rate peak at a certain temperature and then decrease as the temperature begins to uh, be stressful on their bodily functions. So basically to summarize why this is all important, when there's warmer water, there's less oxygen content in the water and when there are warmer temperatures, the fish has a higher metabolic rate. A higher metabolic rate means that they have a higher demand for energy or oxygen, and that higher energy demand means it's harder for them to survive. So especially as a cold water fish, the gist here is the warmer the water gets, the more difficult it is for them to obtain enough energy to feed their uh, metabolic demand. So to bring this into brook trout specifically, uh, a couple studies have done this curve, exactly what I just showed you for brook trout. So I'm showing you that here. So down at the bottom, you see their standard or their resting metabolic rate doing the same thing. It's increasing from five degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius. And then on top, you're seeing their maximum or their active metabolic rate. And it does that same curve, but because, I mean, this is sort of why we call them a generalist because I showed you that curve that was really steep. And that's what we see for a lot of species. But for brook trout, they're actually somewhat of a generalist because their curve really isn't very steep above their standard metabolic rate. But you do see that at 15, that the distance between their two curves is the greatest. And that's what informs us that that's their optimum temperature for growth. Um, so you can see also on there that it aligns with that other data I was showing you that their um, their scope for activity or the amount of energy that they're consuming is less efficient and is likely detrimental to them after 20 degrees because you see those two lines come together. So how is climate change affecting brook trout then? Well, climate change, um, I'm not going <laughs> to go super general with it. I assume we're all quite familiar, but there is predicted significant warming in Ontario, and we expect that our cold water species are going to be hit the hardest um, as warm water or as water warms northward. Their ability to cope in the short term is important both at the population level and at the species level. This figure here is just showing you the growing degree days in Ontario. So um, you can think of it as the accumulation of heat through a year. Um, so it's showing you where the cold zones and the warm zones are as of now. This is a uh, prediction, or sorry, this is a model of uh, climate change in general from 1980 to 2011. So that we can, we're getting an idea of the historic state of Ontario uh, and then sort of what's becoming the new reference state um, and where a lot of our data is being compared to now. And again, this is using growing degree days.
Um, this is a zoomed in version of Algonquin Park or zoomed in right on Algonquin Park because I think this figure is really striking. Um, so the top there, you're seeing the average air temperature from 1981 to 2010 in the park. And you can see that there's a really cold zone there right in the middle. Um, and that's because Algonquin's at such a high elevation. Then down at the bottom, you're seeing um, two different climate scenarios uh, for the same window of time. So from 2041 to 2070, based on the more moderate climate scenario on the left and the more extreme climate scenario on the right. Uh, and you're seeing a difference in temperature here of about four or five degrees average air temperature in certain regions of the park, which is just um, striking and can cause massive consequences for the species there. Then to zone in back down on uh, Southern Ontario, uh, this is just a map showing you uh, what, what cold, how many cold water, sorry, I'm saying that wrong. The likelihood that a watershed is gonna retain its cold water species after climate change uh, in a more moderate scenario. Um, so this is using air temperature and groundwater data. So you're seeing the areas that are really unlikely to retain their cold water species and um, those that are moderately unlikely. And that encompasses most, if not all of brook trout range in this area. This is an even more zoomed in version of uh, similar information. So this is using a more aggressive climate scenario but it's showing you the maximum weekly average temperatures projected out to the 2080s in some GTA watersheds. Um, so to orient you on the far left or the west of the figure is the Credit River watershed. So we're seeing um, very distinct warming across the entire uh, watershed in all cases. This is um, a zoomed in version of where brook trout are in that similar area. Um, and it's showing you where brook trout are absent or present at a wide scale. The legend is in the corner there for you. And what I wanted to point out in this is that brook trout are largely absent from the um, main stem and even uh, second and third order, sorry, the main stem and the larger tributaries of these systems. Um, you can see that they're concentrated um, almost entirely in the headwaters of each of the systems um, and even sometimes in low abundances there as well. So given all that background I've provided, the big question that I'm supposed to talk about today is can they cope with climate change? So brook trout can use these sort of four coping mechanisms to um, cope with climate change. The first one being acclimation. So what I mean by acclimation is how the fish is adjusting to the temperature around them and how it increases the temperatures that they can tolerate. So there's been a multitude of studies done on this. Um, this is sort of our baseline information that we always look for in thermal tolerance studies. And we're measuring their upper thermal tolerance, not necessarily at a functional level, but just um, as a tool that we can use to compare how much acclimation a given population or individual can um, achieve. So down on the bottom left there, um, this group acclimated fish to five different temperatures um, over a long period of time. So you would call them fully acclimated fish. And then they measured their upper thermal tolerance. And this one is interesting because you're seeing the same result that we saw before when I was um, introducing their thermal tolerance, where after about 20 degrees, you're not seeing much change at all in that upper thermal tolerance of the fish. So being acclimated beyond that point no longer has a benefit to the fish and it's likely having a detrimental effect. The same thing on the top right, as acclimation temperature increases, so does the thermal tolerance of the fish. So to point out that ceiling of tolerance is important because as I said, the 20 degree mark is likely what's showing, like that's likely their ceiling that we're um, going to be looking out for when we're predicting their abundance under climate change. And we're seeing at 23, no positive effect has been had. Therefore, there's likely a, a negative effect on the fish at that point. Their tolerance can increase. Their energetic demand might be very high. Um, and that may be a threshold we again have to look out for for stress. So this is showing us again that brook trout are flexible, but they have that firm ceiling. 
Um, in this upper thermal tolerance sort of study, you're seeing it at about 31 degrees Celsius, but that's never a temperature that they would occupy in nature. That's just telling us at a brief window of time, what can they be in before they lose equilibrium or they can no longer um, operate physiologically. Um, we see this, uh, when we do these sorts of studies, we see clear differences among populations, regardless of the temperature that they're acclimated to, but they all do show an acclimated effect. So there are um, population level differences, but brook trout as a species do act as a generalist. The second coping mechanism is a behavioral change. Um, and a behavioral change is when if an individual fish is going to change its behavior at the daily or seasonal level to adjust for changing temperatures. So um, I'm not going to get into describing this figure in too much detail, but what I wanted to point out was the, um, the four sort of patterns that are emerging in brook trout behavior based on temperature preference. So the dark points here are showing you night uh, locations of a fish and the white points are showing you the daytime points of a fish. And you can see that um, these four fish have adopted completely different strategies uh, to cope with warm temperatures during summer months. And um, while some are foraging during day, some are foraging during the night, others have distinct patterns um, like crepuscular where they're only going to go out and forage when the water is a given temperature, then they'll go back to their um, refuge. You'll see the white dots all clustered in one spot there on figure A. Um, and that's where they'll rest, um, conserve their energy before they forage out again. So we can see that some fish will do this. Um, they'll keep the same pattern throughout their lifetime. Other fish will adjust their pattern solely given the um, temperature of the day or the season or the year. Um, and this is how that they account for an energy imbalance based on changing temperatures. That's more um, to do with a lake, uh, although you will see it in streams, but in streams we can really whittle it down to um, fish using these groundwater upwellings to um, behaviorally thermoregulate, we call that. Um, these groundwater upwellings are important, or they're critical to spawning, but they're also just a consistent source of cool water for the fish to use to bring down their internal body temperature. Um, and then again, other things they'll do, like in lakes, they'll shift their daily foraging strategy, particularly in streams, you'll see them shift to a crepuscular pattern um, or a night pattern. Uh, they'll also employ a strategy called passive foraging rather than active. So rather than swimming around and looking for prey, they'll pick a spot in the stream and they'll wait for prey to drift to them. And they'll also use other refuges that aren't necessarily a thermal refuge, but that will provide an energetic refuge for the fish. Things like going to a lower depth for a lower temperature or lower flow. They'll use a shaded area because it'll be slightly lower in temperature um, and it'll provide protection from predators. And then they might also use areas with complex stream structure like roots and rocks and branches because that allows them to rest from swimming in the flow. Um, another coping mechanism that they'll employ is migrating to other suitable habitat. Um, now I would say that this is um, hindered significantly, uh, but I'll get into that. But in a place where it isn't like Algonquin Park, there's a high degree of connectivity in watersheds. Um, so in certain conditions, fish are able to move great distances throughout the watershed. Um, and if a given habitat is not suitable or is becoming thermally stressful for the fish, um, in areas where there is a high degree of connectivity, the fish will move um, to a new habitat. That being said though, if I bring us back to this map showing us the uh, Lake Ontario tributary populations, um, this is just not possible for stream resident fish in Southern Ontario in most cases, because as you'll see here, they're so limited to their headwater habitat that they aren't able to use um, the main stems to move to other areas of suitable habitat because the main stems themselves are either cut off uh, and not connected or they're just too warm for the fish to occupy. Lastly, I'll talk about adaptation as a coping mechanism. Um, but adaptation is complicated because it happens over generations. It's a really complex genetic process. Um, and we're still trying to understand just how quickly and how 
much brook trout would be able to or have been able to adapt to changing thermal conditions. Um, and the other complicated part of this is that other stressors um, make it difficult for us to study, but also difficult for us to predict their response to climate change, especially in areas like Southern Ontario, where they're also dealing with sedimentation and um, deforestation, urbanization, all those sorts of things. It'll be difficult for us to tease out how well they can adapt. So I won't go into this much. This is also not my area of expertise. So those are all the ways they can cope, but there's also a few caveats to how well they can cope with climate change. Um, the first being that populations of brook trout are known to be locally adapted. So some brook trout populations will experience these extreme temperature swings, um, specifically the stream resident populations. They might occupy, so well, some stream resident populations may only occupy temperatures from four to eight degrees year round if their um, stream is heavily fed by groundwater, while others might occupy temperatures that are four to 22 or 23 degrees temperature within a year. Um, other populations of brook trout may live in a habitat that has a relatively stable uh, thermal regime, and that's particularly the lake populations, um, and especially because they're able to stay below the thermocline or the stay in the cold layer of the lake um, and not experience stressful temperatures in a lot of situations. Some populations have retained genes for really high a really high degree of thermal tolerance, while others haven't. Um, to keep it brief, hanging on to these genes is energetically costly. Um, so those populations that didn't need to hang on to their thermal tolerance um, may not have as much as those that did hang on to that gene and may not have as much adaptive potential to increase their thermal tolerance. We also know that certain habitats are changing more rapidly than others, particularly those in developed areas and those headwater streams that have um, that uh, are more influenced by environmental conditions than a large lake would be. Ah, I was gonna show you my fish, a large lake fish, and again, a small stream fish. Skip over that. The next one, uh, the next caveat is that we expect there to be differences in thermal tolerance among life stages, even within a given population. So we know that embryos and spawners may have a limited thermal tolerance compared to juveniles and adults. And juveniles and adults are generally the ones that we're studying in the majority of our thermal tolerance research. So those most vulnerable life stages are actually the least studied. And um, reproduction is what limits population success. Um, and therefore, the limits of reproduction define a given population or species vulnerability to climate change. So by not understanding or not including the thermal tolerance limits of embryos and spawners, uh, we may be underestimating just how at risk brook trout and other species are to climate change. The third caveat that I'll discuss is how climate change is affecting all seasons. So a lot of my research and a lot of fish thermal tolerance research in general focuses on upper thermal tolerance changes in summer temperatures, um, but there is also increased variability in winter conditions, and that does affect fish embryos that incubate through that time, particularly brook trout. Our warmer, shorter winters might change incubation times. There's been an increase in extreme events, um, whether it be freezing events or thaw events that could um, change the um, hydrologic dynamics in the stream or could change the temperatures rapidly. Uh, and there's also the likelihood that there would be a mismatch with food availability um, following embryos hatching in the spring if winter conditions have been particularly unpredictable uh, and the invertebrates that they consume haven't responded in the same way that the brook trout have. Um, this is just a, some preliminary work that I've done that's unpublished so far, but um, I tested the effects of three different thermal regimes on the survivorship of brook trout eggs from four populations. And we can see exactly what I've been discussing here, how populations are having differing responses to this thermal stress, where my two more wild populations uh, had reduced survivorship under changing thermal regimes and the two domesticated or what you would think of as more of a stocked fish uh, didn't seem to have the same effect. 
We can also consider uh, changes in fall conditions as stress around brook trout, um, especially because that's their spawning season. Uh, warmer temperatures may mean that it's a higher energy expenditure and more stress on the fish during spawning. This could reduce the success of spawning um, or the likelihood of survival of that individual. And changes in temperature also change the timing of spawning events and how fish might be able to access spawning sites if there's a thermal barrier before they reach it or a thermal challenge if they were to be migrating up a river. So given all that, the big question is, can they cope with climate change? My answer is maybe, um, because I think it's very context dependent. We know that they're gonna have differing abilities to cope with the effects of climate change based on their ability to acclimate to these local conditions over both the short and long term as individual, individuals and as populations. Um, it'll also depend on the availability of thermal refuge in their system uh, and how well their habitat is connected to others that might be suitable. In order to answer this question, we really need specific evidence-based evidence information on the thermal tolerance of life stages, the cha how changes in seasonal temperatures affect these fish, we need population specific and region specific information. And in fish like brook trout, we especially need to understand how these different ecotypes with different metabolic demands are um, being affected by temperature differently. And this will help us to discern those effects of climate change and it will help us employ effective conservation and management. So I wanted to sort of move into how we can help brook trout cope because I know a lot of the attendees of these seminars are active stewards of uh, our natural environment. So I broke it down into a few levels. So at the individual level, a huge, um, a huge way we can help them cope is through our own individual education and educating others on things like I'm talking about today. Uh, we can also work on our own angling practices. I didn't get too much into it, but um, I did mention that when you are uh, fighting a fish, it's at its maximum metabolic rate. It's using the maximum amount of, amount of energy. It's exerting a lot of energy and it's feeling a lot of stress from that angling event. Um, and there are organizations like Keep Fish Wet and a lot of information out there that um, tells us how to reduce that stress on the fish, especially in warm uh, or in especially stressful temperatures. Um, I'll, I'll leave you to research that more on your own. Uh, other things that uh, property owners can do is um, ensure that they are doing uh, responsible maintenance of their stream or lake uh, shoreline that they have on their property. Um, they're keeping the stream bed intact. Things like riparian planting and a lot of what Nicole was mentioning at the beginning there are very important to um, brook trout as well as keeping track of invasive species on your property or in your area and reporting that. Um, both terrestrial and aquatic invasives are a threat to brook trout um, and can be a synergistic uh, stressor on them along with warmer temperatures. At the local level, again, education is always important. I list it here twice just because, um, but the biggest thing at a local level is the stream habitat restoration um, that groups uh, that you can do as an individual uh, with a local group or with a regional group, and that makes a huge difference uh, for protecting thermal habitat for brook trout. Regional level is similar to local, um, but there's so many local groups that I wanted to highlight, like local conservation authorities, um, fishing and conservation chapters, um, and these groups will generally provide a lot of information about how to advocate for these fish, for these resources, these habitats, and um, the best ways to protect them. They're the front line in um, taking what scientists are saying and putting it into actionable information for conservation and management. At this big provincial federal level, it's really important to support organizations doing this kind of work at all scales. For example, Watersheds Canada, Trout Unlimited and others. Uh, and like we've seen a lot recently with the Greenbelt situation, uh, it's important to vote for and lend support to campaigns that are um, actively working to protect habitat for species like brook trout. So that's all I have for tonight. I just wanted to emphasize again um, the, the question, how are brook trout going to cope with climate change? 
Uh, it really is going to depend on their ability to acclimate, how available thermal refuge is for them and how connected their habitat is. Uh, so thank you all so much for attending and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Erin, for that great presentation. Just before we hop into our question and answer period, I have a couple of things to quickly tell you about. Um, one thing that might be really helpful to the people tuning in today is some resources that we have on our website, which is watersheds.ca. Um, specifically, we have a whole toolkit about cold water creek restoration. So if you're interested in brook trout or you're interested in more of our projects, you can feel free to send us an email or check that out. And then another thing that I wanted to highlight, which is perfect for the upcoming holiday season, is our gift catalog. Um, so on the screen, you can see an example of one of the symbolic adoptions in our gift catalog, which is a brook trout. Um, so with all of our symbolic adoptions, you could give them as a gift and you get a signing postcard that features artwork from different Canadian artists. And you also get a blank thank you card to give along with a gift and there are tax receipts for purchases over for items over $25. And then one more thing that I wanted to mention before the questions, um, and also if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat now so that I can read them aloud to Erin. Um, but the last thing is our survey. So Monica is going to drop in the chat a link to our survey. And we really appreciate if you could take the time, a uh, couple minutes just to fill that out. Let us know what you enjoyed about the presentation and what you're hoping to have as topics in the future. And now I will jump into some of the questions. And the first one I have here is how did Erin uh, get into the research with brook trout? Um, so, uh, as Nicole mentioned at the beginning, I did my undergrad re uh, undergrad degree at UBC in Vancouver, and um, a central focus of the last two years of my degrees was uh, fisheries conservation and management, uh, specifically Pacific salmon, because, you know, you're in Vancouver, um, and I just fell in love with Pacific salmon and um, their importance to the ecosystem at West, uh, but in learning more about Pacific salmon, fell in love with the whole thermal tolerance climate change realm. Um, and this was an opportunity uh, that came up that I thought, well, it's not salmon, but I think trout are really cool too. And then I came to love brook trout far more than I love Pacific salmon. Um, so kind of a very natural progression into this field. Very cool. And another question here, it says, do you have any advice for bringing in community members, municipal staff, or individuals who are not anglers, but can still get involved with these issues? Yeah, my advice would, uh, would be to start with those local and regional groups that are working on the ground uh, on these issues. They're the best way to get connected, involved in the research and the restoration projects. Um, sometimes I feel like the science world is actually disjointed the other direction uh, and not engaging. And I think it's really important to pass from um, scientific academic world uh, into the people working boots on the ground and passing our information off into really digestible, uh, accessible formats uh, and involving people uh, the other direction. So I would look up your best way to start is probably your local conservation authority um, or your local Trout Unlimited chapter, because those are always the two that come to mind when I think about brook trout in Ontario. And another question here, it says, would you say that brook trout populations are also constrained in southern Ontario through competition with non-native introduced trout species such as rainbow and brown trout? Absolutely. Yeah, that was something I chose not to go into, but I realized I guess I had the time. Um, they definitely are. Um, I can particularly speak to brown trout because um, I've read some of their thermal tolerance literature as well. So brown trout are somewhat more thermal tolerant, thermally tolerant than brook trout, and they are able to take advantage of habitats that are a little bit warmer. And so in um, streams and rivers where they are um, already 
competing for resources, the brown trout may have an edge given they're able to use that habitat, get larger, um, take advantage of the resource, et cetera. They're also just more aggressive than brook trout behaviorally. Uh, rainbow trout, uh, similar. There aren't a lot of cases in Ontario where um, there is resident rainbow trout and brook trout competing, um, but certainly areas where there are steelhead moving in and out of tributaries, you will very rarely find brook trout anymore. Again, competitive exclusion, it all plays a role there. Um, brook trout in the streams are a little wimpier and never get that big anymore because they're never doing that migration. So it's absolutely playing um, a factor uh, in where they are in the watersheds and how they're doing. And were hatchery raised stocked brook trout populations part of your research? And if so, have you observed different results in comparison to native or naturally reproducing populations? Yes, so my research has used a blend of hatchery um, or hatchery reared domesticated, so what you would use for stocking strains, um, all the way out to fully wild natural strains. Um, and I definitely have found differences in thermal tolerance. And um, primarily, what you see is certain hatchery strains perform really well uh, in thermal tolerance trials, uh, but it really is dependent on their ancestry. Um, wild strains. Um, it's more to do with their local environment uh, and the temperature that they're acclimated to that will determine how well they're, um, they'll perform in a thermal tolerance trial. Um, so if I'm gonna pull an example, there's the Hills Lake hatchery strain, which is the most common and highest domesticated hatchery strain. And it has a really high thermal tolerance. It's very consistent. Um, it won't, uh, it will increase with acclimation higher than other populations. Um, and they're the biggest, the fattest, the fastest growing fish. Uh, stream resident populations, um, they're gonna be very, um, very adapted to their local conditions. Certain populations won't have the same acclimation response and won't reach the same ceilings. Or um, you'll also see that they'll be more variable within the population than a highly domesticated strain like the Hills Lake strain. And do you have any science journals or articles that you recommend for helping to build a case for support about what's happening to our brook trout populations and how we should take action? And also, is any of your research published? Um, publications I would recommend. Uh, I will plug Darren Smith. He has published a lot recently about brook trout thermal tolerance, um, and he's the one whose review paper I reference nonstop through my own research and in all my presentations. Um, Cindy Chu has uh, done a lot of publishing about climate change and uh, Ontario freshwater species, particularly brook trout. Um, anything that comes out of the Harkness Laboratory, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources um, research station in Algonquin Park, they produce um, peer-reviewed literature and also publicly available information reports about all the populations in the park. Um, and again, your local conservation authorities will have um, a lot of data um, publicly available on their website. Uh, it's not always peer-reviewed, but a lot of it actually does get incorporated into uh, publications that are coming through. Um, I have published one of my studies so far, um, and it was one that was testing acclimation on upper thermal tolerance. That one's in the Journal of Thermal Biology. Um, and some other good journals to check out for this sort of thing are Journal of Fish Biology um, and um, Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences. You'll find a lot of um, local relevant research in that one. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, we'll make sure to link out to those pub publications in our handout that we'll send out later as well. And another question, it says, do you expect brook trout to lose territory to bass with the increase in water temperature? Yeah, absolutely. So that's something that we're seeing a lot of in Algonquin Park. Um, bass aren't, or smallmouth bass particularly, aren't native um, to that region and anywhere where the smallmouth bass are being introduced into brook trout lakes, you see a very 
um, stark decline in the brook trout over time. They're competing for the same resources, but same with the brown trout story. The smallmouth bass are obviously more thermally tolerant than brook trout. Um, and in a lot of cases, they are the number one um, exclusionary species that are pushing brook trout out of their native range. Um, at this point, in a lot of cases, there are barriers to smallmouth bass migrating into brook trout range. Um, but that doesn't stop humans from putting them there, which is generally the number one concern with bass and brook trout. Um, but bass are predicted to be what's called a climate change winner. Um, their range is rapidly expanding as waters warm and brook trout are more into the loser category for sure. And another question here, it says, you said that you think brook trout are maybe going to be able to adapt to the impacts of climate change. How do you stay optimistic about their populations and other species when looking at various climate change models? Do you think that we're too late to take action? I don't think we're too late. Um, I think the the part that gets me down, that gets me disappointed is thinking about like emissions scenarios and the grand scheme of climate change. Um, but knowing what I do, um, they're far more flexible than I think we imagine them to be. They are getting hit hard and are going to get hit hard. Um, but when we do what we can to protect thermal refuge and especially things like groundwater that feed into that thermal habitat that's required for them, they can do exceptional things. They can sustain themselves in very strange situations and in very stressful habitat. Um, so the more I see, I, I it's like a, a minor net positive for me because I keep finding them surprising me about how resilient they are. Not all species are going to have such like a positive resilience story, I think. Um, but at least in brook trout case, take it from someone who's now read quite a bit. Um, they are more resilient than I think. And it gives me a lot of hope for um, what we can do and how many people are passionate about what we can do. And are there opportunities to help with your research or do you know any of, of any brook trout citizen science initiatives? Um, citizen scientists, science initiatives, I'm not quite sure. There actually might be someone, I'm going to call him out, Jacob, on the call right now who might know more about that. Um, but I know that uh, whenever you're interested in getting involved with research, people are really happy to have you. Uh, I personally am pretty much done touching fish for the rest of my PhD, unfortunately. No more cool field work for me. Um, but uh, any university or any research group uh, can always use volunteers. So you can reach out to uh, professors studying fish near you or um, researchers you know are working on brook trout, conservation authorities that do restoration work. Volunteers are always needed um, and it's a great way to get into research as well. That's how I started. And is there a place online where we can discover if there are brook trout in our area and if so, uh, which ecotype are they? Um, nowhere that I know of is gonna tell you like what ecotype they are, but you can pretty much get the gist from what I've shown you here and what habitat they're living in. Um, there's also uh, a lot of information about those sort of coaster, those migratory types on fishing websites that you can look into. Um, the Catch all for where brook trout are. You can use Fish Online. Um, it's a Ontario government resource that tells you what fish are in what water body around you. Uh, I don't. I'm not super experienced with it. I'm not sure it's as accurate for streams in southern Ontario. Um, but uh, then in that case, I would suggest getting in contact with uh, actually local fly fishing shops or local fishing shops um, or. Uh, fishing conservation groups, all that sort of thing, um, and getting involved with the community. A lot of them are kind of secret because people are trying to protect them. Um, but with good intentions, no one's going to hide that from you. So um, just takes a little bit of research in Southern Ontario, especially. And is there a specific reason you chose Algonquin Park? Uh, on your slide as a focus? Is there something special about this population? 
Yeah, Algonquin Park is known as the stronghold for native trout in Ontario and in Canada, really, at this point. Um, it's one of the biggest protected areas in the country, and it holds the um, most dense diversity of populations of brook trout and lake trout. Um, oh, I think a trivia note, there's, I think, 25% of lake trout populations in Canada are within Ontario. Um, so that region of Ontario in particular is well protected, well protected and um, really suitable habitat for this species. Um, and in particular for me, for Algonquin, what I wanted out of studying the fish in Algonquin was of course the iconic populations, beautiful fish, but that was the most accessible to me um, to get those fast growing, larger bodied populations because the majority of my early research was on the stream resident populations and the hatchery populations, but it was important for me to um, look into the differences in uh, thermal stress across the range in Ontario. So uh, I can't do that unless I've got some of those fast metabolism, um, fast growing large bodied fish in there. Uh, and my supervisor did not want to send me to the Sutton River uh, by helicopter. So I drove to Algonquin instead. Very nice. Yeah, that's all of the questions that we have for today. So thank you again to Aaron and thank you for everyone for coming out tonight. So you'll receive a copy of the recording and the uh, webinar handout later this week. And um, don't forget to register for the rest of our upcoming webinars. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for everyone for attending.